So welcome, everyone. Context 365 lunch series. Guy Adami here. I'm going to put my glasses on. That's what happens when you get to be my age. You, you need these things to read. But uh, if if memory serves, this is our seventh one, I believe, maybe six. But they've all been fantastic. I'm here to tell you today's is going to be wonderful as well, uh, because we have to we have Dr. Yaron Brook with us um, and we've talked offline and we're going to talk for a while now. But Dr. Yaron Brook is a co-founder and managing partner of BHZ Capital Management LP, a hedge fund focused on the consolidation trend in American banking. Brooke has been involved in managing funds in the space since 1998. Much of the research that drives the fund's investment is a product of research he and Robert Hendershot, his co-founder, developed as academics in the 90s. Dr. Brooke is chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute, uh, a nonprofit based in Irvine, California. He was a finance professor at Santa Clara University from 1993 to 2000. He's a best-selling author and an internationally sought speaker focusing on the benefits of free markets, uh, which we're going to talk about, the value of business, and the morality of capitalism. Dr. Brooke was born and raised in Israel, served as a first sergeant in his Israeli military intelligence, and earned a BSc in civil engineering from Technion Institute of Technology in Haifa, Israel. Brooke moved to the United States, received his MBA and PhD in finance from the University of Texas at Austin. Hook 'em horns. Absolutely. Dr. Brooke, how are you? Great to have you with us on Context 365 Lunch Series. I am doing great, and thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. As am I. So, you know, what I typically start with, because I think people are always fascinated, I obviously just read your bio, and I probably could have read it for another 10 minutes in terms of things you've done. But if you could tell us a little bit about your journey, how you've gotten here. I know um, your life was fundamentally changed, I think, at the age of 16, 17, when you read The Fountainhead, but maybe you could speak to that to sort of get us started here this morning. Sure. I mean, uh, I grew up in Israel. Israel in the in the 60s and 70s was a very socialist place. It was it was the it was really the only ideology that existed, kind of a collectivist socialist ideology. Uh, I read Atlas Shrugged when I was 16, completely blew my mind and, and changed my life in many respects. Then went on to read everything Ayn Rand wrote and, and became a real advocate for her ideas. I served in the Israeli army and military intelligence for three years, like all Israelis do. And I met my wife there, which, uh, you know, the one great benefit of serving in the army was was uh, was meeting my wife and uh, landed up uh, doing a degree in civil engineering, came to the U.S. when I was 26 uh, to uh, to get an MBA. I liked the idea of management, uh, landed up falling in love with finance and uh, getting a PhD in finance, got a job at Santa Clara University where I met my business partner, Robert Hendershot, was always kind of interested in these ideas that Ayn Rand, of Ayn Rand's ideas, so pursued that passion while I was a professor and while I've been uh, in the past running, uh, managing the, the hedge fund. Um, started on 98 as sub-advising a, um, a large offshore hedge fund at the time and uh, did that for 10 years with Robert while uh, at 2000, I took over the job as CEO of the Ayn Rand, of the Ayn Rand Institute. So that was a lot of fun, did a lot of exciting things, uh, retired from that in 2017, basically came on board with the hedge fund full time. Uh, we stopped sub-advising in 2008 and uh, launched our own fund in 2010. And uh, that's where we are today uh, in the process I've written uh, you know, three or four books, uh, have, have done uh, many, many hours of uh, TV interviews and have my own podcast today and uh, travel around the world speaking and uh, lecturing. And, and, and it's, it's been a great ride. It's been a great ride. And it's great to have you with us. Real, real excited. So, you know, we were talking before we started and I've said this, I've written about it. I've said it on our show that I, I, be I believe, and I'm not suggesting I'm right. It's just my beliefs that amongst the many villains of the 21st century, and it's a long list, I think on top of that list is going to be central bankers, specifically our Fed officials. And, you know, we, we like to think we're in this great capitalist society, but, you know, how can it be true capitalism when we basically capitalize gains and socialize losses, which is effectively what we've done for the last three decades? Could you care to speak to that? Because I'd love to have that conversation. Absolutely. And look, it's, it goes further, way further back than the last three decades. And really, how can you have capitalism 
when the most important price in an economy, which I think is interest rates, is centrally planned, and when the tool of exchange, the most important tool we have in a capitalist economy, money, is again centrally planned. You know, people forget before we had a Federal Reserve, we had banks printing money based on reserves of gold, or, or you know, theoretically, you could have anything in reserve and let let the best reserve kind of currency win. You could have Bitcoin today, uh, whether Bitcoin would win in a free market, I'm dubious, but but you could have that. Let banks compete in terms of the quality of their money. That's true free markets. Since the establishment of the Federal Reserve, uh, we've had a Great Depression, which almost every economist today believes was caused to a large extent by errors of central planners at the, at the Federal Reserve. The, the Great Depression would not have happened if they had not, in a sense, tightened the money supply as we went into a recession and caused the Great Depression. And lots of other mistakes were made to bring about a Great Depression, but certainly wasn't a phenomenon of capitalism, as is often taught by historians. Economists understand this. Then, of course, we got the, 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 the inflation and stagflation of the 70s, purely monetary phenomena caused by the Federal Reserve. And then I would argue, uh, you know, from the, from the SNL crisis, where we socialized socialized the risk, right? We took away, we, we bailed everybody out in the SNL mm -hmm. crisis and uh, issued bonds and socialized all of those losses uh, to the great financial crisis, which I think was caused by government policy, Federal Reserve policy, by Alan Greenspan and by Ben Bernanke. Uh, and then again, we, we, we bailed everybody out uh, and, and uh, distributed the cost of this to, uh, to taxpayers. Uh, all the way to today, where we had COVID, and look, COVID was horrible, and the economic consequences were horrible, and we had lockdowns, which on many fronts were horrible. And in what we did was we basically bailed everybody out. Now, anybody, anybody who has any understanding of the world reality knows that there's no free lunch, as Milton Friedman used to say, right? Uh, bailing everybody out has to have a cost. You can't just print money with, 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 with no consequences. You can't bail out zombie companies in the bond market and expect everything to return to normal and things are going to be great. I don't know what the cost is going to be. I don't know how we're going to pay for it in the next 10, 20 years, but we're going to pay for it. It might be we'll pay for it with lower growth. It might be that we pay for it with another financial crisis. It might be that we pay for it with inflation. Hard to tell, but we're going to pay for it. And yet nobody cares. Uh, well, as, yeah. No, no, please continue, because I want to I want to sort of I want to amplify that. But please continue. Yeah, no, look, I, I believe Ben Ben Bernanke is the villain of the of the uh, great financial crisis. He and, and Paulson <clears throat> basically panicked. Uh, they had no clue what was going on. Uh, people forget uh, in the last half of 07 in uh, really up until October of 2008, you can take Bernanke's statements uh, all of his public statements, every single one of them turned out to be wrong, right? Uh, this is not going to be any problem. Real estate never causes a big recession. Uh, Freddie and Fannie are fine. Don't worry about them. He was wrong on everything. Paulson was wrong on everything. Paulson panicked. We need $700 billion and give me the authority to do whatever I want with it. Uh, and yet they came out of this crisis as heroes when they, I think they are the villains. You know, they, they don't bail out Lehman, but they bail out uh, AIG the next day. Mm -hmm. Completely random, completely arbitrary, completely, complete, you know, central planners uh, par excellence, something we have not really seen in America. Uh, and yet now it's taken for granted that the central government is responsible for every aspect of economy to bail out, to choose winners and losers. We've lost what made this country really special, which was freedom. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned Lehman Brothers. And if memory serves, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I, was, I think it was also Lehman Brothers that walked away from the table during the long-term capital thing. And you know, there's a vindictiveness, and there's, you know, these people have long memories in terms of, you know, all right, you know, fine back then. But I think Lehman paid the price for walking away from LTCM uh, whenever that was, you know, 96, I'm, I'm you know, memory. I think, I think that was, yeah. And of, so, course, of course, Paulson was from Goldman, right? Exactly. It, it was never any love uh, lost between Goldman and Lehman. Uh, you know, and, and, and you, you told me uh, before that you originally were Drexel. Mm -hmm. And of course, remember how Drexel was shut down uh, with a phone call from 
it was shut down from a phone call from Alan Greenspan. So yes, it was. central bankers have, and for no reason, in my view, completely arbitrary decision by a central bank, central bankers have exerted unbelievable power. They have caused unbelievable amounts of harm. We have seen less stability since the existence of central banks, not just in the U.S., but across, uh, across the, the world. Uh, you know, the, the people have this mythology about before central banks, things were crazy. No, things are much crazier since the establishment. So, yes, I agree with you about uh, about the, the lack of, uh, of freedom and the fact that they are the villains of the 20th and 21st century. So let me ask you a question. Um, is a re- recessions a bad thing? They don't have to be. That is, recessions are a way in which we cleanse the market, right? You get excesses in every market. You get you get overinvestment. So, for example, you know that during the dot com bubble, it was a bubble. Now, bubbles are not bad because what happened in the bubble is a lot of money flowed into a new industry. We didn't know who the winners and losers were going to be, so a lot of too much money, in a sense, went in, but too much by whose standard, right? Uh, by markets overinvested. There was a correction. Cool, and. Internet, as we know, bounced back nicely and today and has boomed since the dot-com bubble has done phenomenally well. Look at Amazon. Amazon is one of the winners. It did phenomenally well. We forget about pets.com. Who cares, though? Right? Overall, wealth was created during the dot-com bubble, even when you take the bubble into account, even when you take the crash into account. That's a healthy type of recession. It, it weeds out the, the malinvestment. It weeds out the unproductive. It weeds out... Uh, those companies that shouldn't exist, uh, that, that are, you know, what we call today zombie companies that, it, that, mm-hmm. that are dead, but are somehow kept alive. Uh, and, they, and they're healthy. In, in, uh, there's a famous recession in 1920-21, where there was this very, very steep recession. The, the federal government did absolutely nothing. The Federal Reserve did absolutely nothing. And the bounce back was immediate, quick, and sustained us through most of the 1920s. So uh, I think the problem is not recessions. The problem is our response to the recession. Well, it's interesting. You know, I, I do a fair amount of public speaking as well. And, and indulge me just for a minute, if you could. You know, I tell a story, the day of the great Chicago fire, late 1800s, there was also a fire in Pestrico, Wisconsin. To this day, the deadliest fire in the history of the United States, depending on your textbook, it killed anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 people. And effectively born from that was uh, the National Forestry Service. And in large part, their job was fire sequestration. Because as they learned, you know, fires were not only destructive and unsightly, but they were deadly as well. And if they could somehow quell or sequester fires, it would be a great thing for mankind, right? But I think what they wound up learning the hard way is that as painful, destructive, potentially deadly as forest fires are, they're a natural part of the cycle, right? Old trees burn down, new trees grow. It's, mm-hmm. it's necessary. And what they learned, again, the hard way, you know, fires that would, you know, trees that had been impervious to fire were now falling victim because these fires were 10 times worse. And I tell that story because, you know, history is littered with disastrous outcomes born of good intentions. And I think that's what happened with Chairman Greenspan. He said to himself, well, wait a second, I can alchemy out the recession portion of the cycle and if I can do that, we'll all be better off for it. But it's, a, it's essential because otherwise we wind up with 08 and 09. And, and I'm sure there are a lot of people that are not in the head in agreement right now. A lot of people saying, you know, both of us are crazy. But we have to go through this. You know, you have to allow corporate Darwinism to work. Otherwise, you don't have a system. Absolutely. And, and it's not just that you get these shocks in 8 or 09, but you get more subtle impacts. You get bad investments, you get companies around that shouldn't be around. And the consequence of that is slow growth. I mean, we forget that over the last 10 years during Obama and during, uh, during Trump, the economy barely grew. It grew at 2%, yep. 0.5. That, that's not real economic growth. I mean, if we had grown at 2%, uh, you know, starting at the beginning of, this, of the 20th century, if we'd grown only at 2% throughout that period, We'd be almost as poor as Mexico, right? We, we, we the, the, the wealth that we have is a consequence of the fact that we have grown a three, four, five percent during part of those periods. And, and the two percent and below growth that I expect that we're going to experience in the decades to come is a, is a consequence of all the government intervention that we're seeing uh, in our economy and, uh, and in the financial markets and in preventing that healthy 
you know, Shumcheta, the economist, called it creative destruction. Uh, some industries have to go out of business for new ones to be born. Uh, we, we, some businesses have to go out of business so that we can increase productivity with new businesses, new technologies. And, and we are, we're stopping that in its, in, in its track. And the Fed uh, is actively involved in that the more it intervenes in the marketplace. So, you know, and, and I'm, I love this conversation, part of which because, you know, I try not to be dogmatic, but I, clearly I have views as you do as well. But, you know, when I hear, you know, people like you who are far, a lot smarter than I am, you know, sort of reinforce my some of the belief systems that I have, I, I get a little bit amped up. But so so I'll ask you, I'll ask you this question. Um, you know, the, one of the Fed's mandates, I, I believe the Fed has a dual mandate as well. I happen to think the dual mandate is to make sure the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 go up every day. And I've said that on TV and, you know, I get ridiculed and criticized for it. But I actually really think that's the case, because um, if, if you look and I know you know this, but 73 percent of the U.S. economy is driven by the consumer. It's a consumer driven economy. And to me, all consumer spending is, is an overlay of the S&P 500. And I'm not suggesting because everybody owns stocks. That's not my point at all. My point is, I think people make the jump that, listen, <laughs> stock market goes up every day must mean the economy is doing well. If the economy is doing well, why can't I buy that you know, Starbucks coffee or why can't I buy the Mercedes that my neighbor has as well? And, you know, people view um, the stock market through that lens, like things must be going well. If things are going well. I can spend money. If you look over the last however many years, consumer spending stops on a dime and we have prolonged or precipitous drops in the stock market. Uh, and I think that's not I don't think that's lost on our officials. Is it? Am I being too simplistic here, or are they too focused on the stock market in terms of some of their policies? Well, there's no question they're too focused on the stock market. I disagree with you, though, on the role of consumption. While I think most economists view 73% of the economy, and I think the Fed looks at it that way, that doesn't make any sense to me. It just, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, people, you can only consume what you produce. You can't consume more than you produce. Now, you can take on debt to consume more, but even then, think about, think about consumption. In order to consume something, I have to earn money in some capacity, i.e. by producing, in order to make that consumption. So before I can consume, I have to produce. And then what I consume has to be produced by somebody. So there's a sense in which for every act of consumption, there are two acts of production, right? Me producing in order to have the money to consume, and the, the good being produced. I think where we get confused is this idea that the government can just create money out of nowhere without any production, right? And, and, uh, and indeed it does in a sense, but, but again, that has costs. The more we focus on consumption as the driver of the economy, the more bad decisions we are going to make. What drives an economy long-term is production. What drives production long-term is ingenuity and investment, right? And more and more in the economy we have today, it's ingenuity because you can today invent things, produce things, build things with less and less capital. That's what happens in a, in a kind of internet world. Instead of focusing on how do we encourage entrepreneurship and innovation, that should be the entire focus. Uh, focusing on innovation and increasing, increasing entrepreneurship. We focus on consumption. We focus on the wrong thing, and uh, and as a consequence, we have bad economic policies across the board. So, so it's interesting. And now I'm going to really twerk you. I know, and it, I'm I want to do that because this, I love this conversation. You know, Stephanie Kelton and Olivier Blanchard. I mean, they'll say, "Well, you're you're wrong." I mean, you're, you, you, MMT is you know where we should be focused on, and. You know, we're Neanderthals in our thinking. I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're looking at everything the wrong way. Thoughts on that? Look, I, I think MMT is, is a form of uh, make-believe economics. I think somebody, somebody once called it kind of voodoo economics. You remember that term? From mm -hmm. George, I think it was George Bush. Uh, 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 yes, yeah, I think George Bush called it voodoo economics. Uh, he called, I think, Reagan voodoo economics, something like that. Anyway, I think this is real voodoo economics. Um, while MMT makes some interesting observations about a world in zero interest rates, the fact that the world is at zero interest rates is already a problem and is already artificial. There, are no, there is no such thing as zero interest rates 
in a in a market. There is no such thing as a, a zero interest rate in a in a in a true market economy. So already zero interest rates is weird. Uh, they make some interesting observations about that world in terms of the interchangeability of money and bonds and so on. Um, but look, the idea that we can create money out of nowhere and the creation of money creates economic activity is, is I believe, nonsense on stilts. Economic activity is created with ideas, put into action, products created. In the world in which we live today, you don't need a lot of money to create products. Uh, you don't need a huge amount of capital in order to start a company today. You need a great idea, you know, talent, you need skill sets. Uh, you know, we could talk about immigration or why we need immigrants because we need that skill set. We need to bring people in who can actually create these companies and work at these companies. Unfortunately, our educational system ain't producing them. Uh, and um, but but what we need are thriving entrepreneurs who have great ideas and innovations. Ingenuity is what drives economic growth, not money. Money is the consequence of production and great ideas. It shouldn't be the drive. Listen, I, listen, I agree. And I'll say this, and you know, I, I, obviously I'm enjoying this conversation a great deal. I, I, one of the, to me, and I've said this and I've written about this, one of the many unintended consequences of the Fed's policies over the last you know, 13 or so years, I think it's made corporate America lazy. And why is that? Because they haven't had to focus on their businesses. You can borrow money cheap. You buy back your stock. You pay a dividend. The market goes up. Nobody gives a you know what. And everything's fine. Meanwhile, the world's passing by. And then people say to me, well, give me anecdotal evidence. And I'll give you a couple, doctor. It's you know General Electric. I mean, the world absolutely passed by this company in, in, a, in, in a historical company that buy back stock. And oh, by the way, IBM. And then they'll say, well, you know, it's hard for them to pivot. I said, well, Microsoft was able to do it. It's pretty much the same company. And Honeywell has been able to do it. So there are examples where companies have actually evolved, but it's made a lot of companies really lazy and, and, and really myopic in their thinking. And, and think about IBM. IBM did a major pivot. Uh, I think it was in the early 90s, in the late 80s, early 90s, from being a mainframe company, right? And it pivoted to a services company and it needed to pivot again now. And it doesn't, there's not that energy. There's not that pressure. There's not that willingness to be flexible. Look, one of the things that stock buybacks indicate is the fact that for many of these large companies, they don't have good investment opportunities. Now it could be they don't have good investment opportunities because they're lazy, but it also could be that they don't have good investment opportunities because they don't have them. They, they don't exist in our economy. I think the biggest problem we face in the U.S. economy today is that lack of entrepreneurial energy, that lack of innovation, there's lack of new ideas. They still exist, but they're very, very focused in one place, Silicon Valley. And I don't mean geographically Silicon Valley. I mean the mentality of Silicon Valley that might exist in Austin, Texas, and a few other places. But it's in a few areas in technology. But where is that spirit when it comes to every aspect of our economy, every industry has the potential to innovate, particularly given the, 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 the technological revolution we're living through. And yet we're not seeing that. And I think what's holding that back is to some extent laziness and conservatism on the part of, of, of many business people, but it's also the heavy hand of regulation, the, the, the mentality outside of the tech world that failure is unacceptable, Remember that startups fail all the time, and that's mm -hmm. acceptable in Silicon Valley, not so acceptable in other industries. We need a cultural, political, economic change in this country to drive real innovation, real progress, real ingenuity. Uh, and, and, and to me, that is, that is key. You know, I just, I just launched a new project called Ingenuism uh, with, my, with my business partner, Robert Hendershot. And um, the focus there's going to be, what do we need to do to create a culture of real ingenuity, a culture of real economic growth that is sustainable over the long run? And that is going to require changing culturally how we think about the world. If people are interested in genuism.com, uh, we just started a couple of weeks ago. And, and the idea is to really educate people about what has made Silicon Valley unique and how we can export that mentality and that culture into every industry and how we can reduce the, the political constraints that exist today on real innovation. You know, airplanes today, every generation of Boeing is slower than the previous generation. 
right? The last in real innovation in airplanes was Concorde. And, and we know where that landed up, right? In, in, the, in the trash heap of history, it's gone. Why, are we, why don't we have faster airplanes? Well, all you have to do is look at, at, at the regulatory burdens that we place on this industry. And, and one of the exciting phenomena right now in, in aerospace is the number of, of, um, of startups focusing on um, uh, new technologies and airplanes to get them significantly faster, faster than the speed of sound and, and to, to provide, you know, it would be great if we could get to London on the days where we could go to London, right? Maybe, maybe in a few months, hopefully uh, in, in uh, you know, in two, three hours from New York rather than in the six that it takes today. Yeah, it's fascinating. You know, I actually spent time in Wichita, Kansas, not to bore the you know what out of you, but I, I, I mentioned that because some of the biggest companies in the United States are based out of Wichita. One of them is Spirit Aerosystems. And, you know, they build, I want to say, you know, 70 percent or so of Boeing's planes. And you're right. I mean, it's fascinating to see, you know, planes being made probably the same way they were made 30, 40 years ago. But they have now sort of found themselves in the 21st century. But I, I, I understand what you're saying in terms of, you know, being sort of lost, you know, there is no real innovation in certain things. And, and I think it's the fear of failure is what holds companies back. But, you know, that's another conversation probably for another time. I want to ask you this question, and I don't mean to be leading, but, you know, I, I know what my views are. October 2018, I think Jerome Powell had been in office or been in that seat for a few months and came out and basically said, and I'm paraphrasing that, you know, we're going to we're going to be on a path to normalize rates. And in terms of reducing the balance sheet, I think he said something like we're going to be on autopilot. And from that time in October to early December, the market went down, stock market went down 19.9%. And he completely reversed course. I think part of which be, is because of the stock market. The other part was the pressure he was facing from the Trump administration. I would submit that he was on the right track. Am I out of my mind no, I agree completely. I mean, zero interest rates are insane. It doesn't make any economic sense. Uh, it is an artificial. Uh, it is an official creation of central bankers. It's an artificial creation of their monopoly over money and and the manipulation of it to get to a proper economic scenario. You know, real rates need to be positive, not negative, uh, and uh, and and we need to start returning those rates uh, to normal. Now, ideally, in my world, Federal Reserve wouldn't involve itself in interest rates, right? It would leave the market to do interest rates. It, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't try to manipulate the long rate, the medium rate, or the short-term rate uh, it, to the extent that it, anybody believes that they have to have a, a monopoly over the issuance of money. Okay, uh, you can control the money supply to some extent, maybe have a rule, that would be cool, if you actually had a rule on how you were going to control the money the money supply, and then let the market determine the interest rate based on your actions. Don't target interest rates. Target a certain rule in terms of how much you're going to increase the supply of money. It's, it's um, you know, truly, uh, I, I never understood why Powell was, uh, was appointed uh, chairman of the Fed, until October, until, you know, December of 18. And I understood completely the reason was that he was susceptible to real pressure. Uh, his, uh, the, the guy who was competing with him was an economist from, uh, from Stanford, from mm -hmm. uh, associated with the Hoover Institute, who had, who was going to put the Fed on a rule-based monetary system uh, that would have been far superior to what we have today. Uh, and, um, but he would have not been susceptible to political pressure, and therefore he was not appointed. Well, it's interesting you say that because I think you're speaking about Kevin Warsh. Is that correct? No, and uh, I'm, I, I feel bad about the fact that the name has slipped from my mind. But no, that's, that's okay. That's I what happens with I age. thought Kevin Warsh. I thought he was in. But but your point is well taken. I, I think you know. I think the administration put on somebody they thought they could. Um, control. And, and, and this is where we are now. Again, I'm sure Jerome Powell's a lovely man. And people say he worked on in Wall Street. He did. He was an attorney, though, if you recall. So yes. not necessarily um, somebody with market sense. But that's, again, you know, another conversation for another time. Let me ask you this. Um, I've said this. I've written about this. Every fiat currency in the history of mankind has ended in disaster, starting from the Roman Empire. And as recently as, you know, we've seen Venezuela, Zimbabwe, you obviously saw it in pre-World War I Germany um, when they were 
burning, you know, citizens were actually burning the Deutschmarks um, to, to heat their homes. I'm not suggesting we're headed down that road, but what's the difference? I mean, you know, you tell me what the difference is between the U.S. dollar and any fiat currency in history. I mean, I'm curious to know, you know, your thoughts on that. So let me just note that the economist I mentioned was John Taylor. Um, and the Taylor rule is, of course, the monetary rule that he came up with uh, that would, I think, have been, been far superior to anything they've got today. Um, there is no difference. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, what we're seeing with fiat currency is that the temptation of the uh, central authority uh, is to use that for political purposes. And, and that is to use it to print up money in order to distribute it. We're more sophisticated today than we were, let's say in Weimar Germany in the 1920s, we have better models, we have more computational power, we, we were better at a little bit of predicting the future. But at the end of the day, this is not about economics, this is about politics. And, uh, and you can see that in all the bailouts, you can see that in all the, the these massive stimulus packages, and it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat, they all print up money in order to buy our votes. That's, exa that's exactly what they're doing. It, it was pretty explicit um, in the Trump administration. It's explicit with Biden. Uh, is our infrastructure really crumbling? Give me a break. Uh, it, you know, do we need $4 trillion? And, and if you look at the bill, half of it isn't even infrastructure. It's just handouts to, to a variety of different people. Uh, no, but once you can print money and once you convince yourself, MMT in this case, that there's no cost to printing money, that it's cost free, then the, you know, we're off to the races. And the consequence of this is ultimately either inflation and significant inflation. We're not talking about two to three percent, but significantly higher than that. I lived in Israel uh, during a period in the, in the 1980s where we had close to a thousand percent inflation. They took four zeros off the currency just to keep to catch up so that you didn't have to have wheelbarrows to, to pay for stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's either inflation or default. Uh, and, and it might be that politically default is less painful than, uh, than uh, inflation, but we'll see. Uh, I, I don't think we're quite there yet. And who knows? You know, the other alternative is that they keep managing to hide the inflation somehow. In some ways, a lot of this money goes into the stock market and it doesn't really go into consumer prices. Uh, we'll see if they can if they can hide that inflation and how, for how long they can hide the inflation. But it, it then, if that happens, then you get the kind of malinvestment we talked about earlier and what you get is stagnation. The worst of all worlds, of course, is what we had in the late 1970s, which is stagflation, which according to most economists who are advising the government is actually an impossibility, right? to have both inflation and stagnation. They think inflation is caused by economic growth somehow. Um, but you had high unemployment and you had inflation, which again, they think is impossible based on the, 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 uh, on the Phillips curve, which I, I thought, you know, Nixon declared in the early 70s, we're all Keynesians now. By the time of the early 80s and Ronald Reagan, nobody was a Keynesian. And now Keynes is like old fashioned, right? He's too <laughs> conservative. He's too free market oriented now. It's it's MMT and MMT all the way. Well, you can't. But you know this as well. I mean, to the extent that everything is political, you can't run on a platform of we have to take our medicine during my administration because you're not going to get elected. So by definition, there's no end to this. I mean, how does it you know, how does it end when, you know, you can't be elected on a platform of it's it's time um, for us to sort of get ourselves back on the rails? So it, if you think about it, I mean. I don't know how it ends because by definition, it almost can't. Now, I would say we have inflation in spades. They just choose not to measure it. I mean, if you're a citizen of this country, you know, and I know that, you know, inflation has been ticking up pretty consistently over the last few years and you're seeing it all across the board. Oh, by the way, you're also seeing it in asset inflation, which obviously they don't measure, which is, again, another conversation. But, you know, how do you get away from this when you can't run on a on a platform of we're going to finally do what's right. So I think inflation is very, very difficult to measure. So I'm not sure whether we've had price inflation. My, uh, my argument is that really over the last 40 years, certainly 30 years, we should have had declining prices, significantly declining prices. If you think of what it means to have dramatically increased productivity globally, 
right? So think about what it should mean for prices in the U.S. to have China come on board, to have technology come on board. We should have seen significant declining prices. I think where the money has gone is in keeping prices flat when we should have seen them declining dramatically. We also don't know how to measure increased um, quality. So, uh, you know, a computer today costs the same as a computer 20 years ago. But it's not the same beast, right? It's completely different. Uh, it's much more productive, much more efficient today than it was 20 years ago. We don't know how to measure that and make those adjustments. So I think part of the problem is we don't really have a good measure of price inflation. We don't know how to measure it. Of course, housing has gone up dramatically. Uh, you know, assets have got, other assets have gone up dramatically. Other things have gone down dramatically. Uh, healthcare and education have gone up. It's interesting. Anything that government touches, housing through zoning and not in my backyard and all that stuff, housing where they restrict supply, education, uh, where they provide student loans and healthcare, where they fund uh, about 60% of all edu- uh, healthcare costs. Everything the government touches goes up in price. Everything that's left to the market goes down in price, just, just a, as an aside. I don't know how it all ends. Um, it doesn't end well. And, uh, and, and what the government has gotten very good at doing is spreading the pain out over many years so that nobody actually feels it, right? It, it, you don't feel the, we should have grown at 3%, we're only growing at two. Or we should have grown at 2%, we're only growing at one. Or maybe we should have grown at 6% and we're only growing at one. You don't feel that because there's no alternative universe over there where we grew at 6%, right? And they're very good at, at, at doing that. And then, and then saying, like Trump did, this is the greatest economy in human history. No, it was an unbelievably mediocre you know, uh, growth rate. It was an unbelievably mediocre economy. But we, since we didn't have the alternative, we couldn't see the alternative, everybody thought, oh, this is great. It's fascinating. I happen to agree with you. So, I, I mean, and I'm sorry to our audience. We've taken, we've you know, done a lot of ranting here. I, I'm, I'm the, the, the culprit, not you, by the way. But in terms of banks, I mean, where are we? You know, what are you viewing banks here in the United States? We, we heard just Jamie Dimon's letter came out. I want to say last week. Maybe it was two weeks ago. So I apologize if I'm off. Uh, he spoke about, and I'm paraphrasing again, sort of the existential risk that some of these um, established banks face with. DeFi and everything that's going on. Can you sort of speak to your views on where we are? I mean, we're clearly, well, I mean, I don't know if we're clearly overbanked or not, but I mean, there's clearly things going on. There's a sea change in traditional banking right before our eyes. Well, the major sea change in traditional banking right before our eyes is is technology. Look, technology is overwhelming. Um, One of the things we learned from COVID is that even gray-haired guys like me can actually do all our banking online. We, we don't have to go to the branch and get to know and talk to the manager and sit down and have a cup of coffee with them. We can do everything we need to do online. We might like going to the branch, but there's no need for doing that. And, and one of the challenges the United States banking system has is we have 5,000 banks, 5,000 banks. 4,900 of those banks can't compete with the technology platform JP Morgan Chase has. They just have a superior, they have the, the heft, the capital to invest in best of class technology. They can buy fintech and, and bring the fintech in house and deploy it. Uh, your little bank in your small community doesn't have that ability. And yet you can bank with Chase from anywhere, anywhere in the country. Why would you go to your little bank that, that doesn't really give you that much uh, added value anymore? I think this is going to create even more pressure on small banks to sell, right? Uh, to sell themselves from medium-sized banks to grow as big as they can so they can invest in technology. Also, we're seeing that the um, a real estate play here, right? And we see this in retail space all over the country. The value of having brick and mortar has come down dramatically. So one of the things you're going to see more and more of is bank A buying bank B, uh, that, it, that has overlapping branch networks with it, shutting down all their branches. You saw that with, uh, with, with the BB&T SunTrust Mojo, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That Mojo was a real estate play. They shut down all the branches because they were across the street from one another. They don't need two branches. They can have one. Uh, massive cost savings. And again, take those costs, invest it into technology because that is where the future is. Uh, it's an interesting history if you're interested um, and why, we're over, why we have so many banks in the United States, and it goes back to the theme of what we just discussed. 
And and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Just so it goes back to the founding. It goes back to debates between Jefferson and Hamilton about whether about a distrust of financial power and and, and big banks. And, And Jefferson won the debate. And as a consequence, we're very always being as a culture, very suspicious of banks. Uh, afraid of them growing too big, afraid of giving them too much uh, uh, things to do. And as a consequence, banks were regulated at the state level, and they were, for almost all of American history, banned from having branches outside of their state. In some states, like Illinois, you had unit banking. The bank could have one branch. That's it. Continental Illinois, I don't remember if you, I don't know if you remember Continental Illinois going bankrupt in 1984, I think. Largest bank failure in American history up, up to that point. It had one branch in downtown Illinois, downtown Chicago. That's it, right? And, and uh, you know, so no geographic diversification, zero, zilch. Uh, we had at the peak close to 20,000 banks in the United States. Canada, which has a similar geography to ours, has 13 banks. The United States has had, I think we've had 12 banking crises in our history. Canada, zero. Never had a banking crisis. To a large extent, that is a consequence of the diversification their banks have geographically across industries. Well, we have not, and we've created unhealthy relationship between small rural banks and the big money center banks. Um, so all of that really came to a head in, in the 70s and 80s during the SNL crisis. And Congress finally did something good. It, it, it's rare, but it once in a while does. And in 1994, they basically changed the laws and allowed banks to merge and consolidate across state lines with no restrictions. And since 1994, about anywhere between 4 to 6% of all American banks uh, sell every single year like clockwork. That is, we're going from 20,000 banks, we, we, we went to 13, now we're at 5,000 banks. You know, if, if you matched the number of banks to our GDP and you compared us to other OE, uh, developed countries, we should probably have about 400 banks. Uh, more efficient would probably be 100 banks. We're heading in that direction. So we've seen massive consolidation over the last 20 years. I think that trend is going to accelerate. The first four months of this year have seen uh, a rate of consolidation that would make this year, uh, we'll ha- we, we would have more sales of public banks than in any other year if we continue at this pace. Uh, and I think, I think there's a good chance we will because of the technology point we made. And because last year, because of COVID, there was almost no bank mergers, very few. It's interesting. So in the last few minutes we have, I, and it's, we've gone now 45 minutes without even mentioning the word, I think. But, you know, the role of Bitcoin, I mean, again, I, I would submit correctly or incorrectly. It's just my view that, you know, the birth of Bitcoin was born out of everything we've just spent the last 45 minutes talking about. Is, is that somewhat accurate? Do you feel that way? I think that's right. I think Bitcoin was born because of frustration with central banks. It was born because of uh, the existence of capital controls around the world. Uh, it was born because there is uh, the, there is a, a a real frustration of 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 the, the kind of the planned economy and people wanting autonomy. Whether it is the right tool, whether it'll break loose, whether governments would allow it to break loose, I think people underestimate the power that governments have, even over something like Bitcoin. And uh, if 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 uh, the U.S. government and, and and the Federal Reserve decide they want to kill Bitcoin. They can, to a large extent, I think, kill Bitcoin. Uh, You know, we will see if this is the solution. But there is immense frustration out there in the marketplace uh, over the fact that our currency is unhinged. It's not connected to anything in reality. And uh, it is completely, completely dependent on political whim and political thirst for power, politicians' thirst for power. And we need to get away from that. And whether Bitcoin is the solution or whether there are going to be other solutions coming up or whether we ultimately have to see a collapse of the dollar to get us there, that is all hard for me to tell exactly. I'm, I'm not very good at predictions, but uh, in, 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 on the macro sense, I think nobody is. All I can say is, you know, nothing good is going to come from all this, uh, all this spending and manipulation. No, I appreciate that. And it's interesting. The, the best people the best predictors 
are the people that say they're not that good at predictions, by the way. That's what I've learned because people that get paid to do it are actually the worst at it. But I want to be respectful of your time. I do think you're going to stay on, Dr. Yarenbrook, but on behalf of Context 365, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Again, the fact that some of most of our views line up does not hurt at all. But thanks for being so generous with your thoughts and thanks for being so generous with your time. And I want to thank the folks at Context 365 for another great uh, lunch interview. So, folks, thanks for your time. If I'm not mistaken, you're sticking around. If I am mistaken, I apologize. But I'm, I'm bowing out gracefully. So thanks again, doctor. I appreciate uh, it. Thank you, Guy. Enjoyed it.